so what we saw in, uh, in day one was also a bit about uh, age levels. And now I want to explain how we actually use them in uh, inside the hot library. Uh, there we use them a lot with type classes. I won't say too much about type classes. Uh, I just want to mention that there's this very nice tutorial here, which in part is written by Mathieu and Pierre Castellan. Um, and also want to say a little bit about high inductive types. So Andre didn't really get to that yesterday, but we'll hear a lot more about this uh, this week. Um, so the propositions, or the mere propositions, as we say in the, the book, uh, the age propositions, they're closed under a number of constructions. For example, for all uh, uh, arrow types, uh, product types, existence of quantification, where the domain is a proposition. And this holds in general. So the age levels, they're closed under uh, pi types, sigma types, identity types, and equivalences. And if, uh, in, except in an exceptional case, also under the inductive types. So if both, and there's a special case, so-called W types, three types if you want. Um, so depending on the constructors of the inductive types, if they're both, uh, if, if the constructors are not the, um, sorry, the, the parameters, if they're not too complicated, then the inductive type itself will not be too complicated either. So we look at the overture, we actually define contractible is an H prop and it's an H set uh, based on these uh, natural numbers. They actually go from minus, minus two and then we add them like so using this notation. Um, now, because we know that the H levels are actually closed on all these constructions, usually if you have a complex type, we can see um, quite easily just by staring at it, what the, uh, the age level should be. And fortunately, COP can also help us to derive that. Uh, but we need to steer that, uh, that mechanism a little bit. Um, but to do that, we use uh, Cox type classes. And again, this is one of these, uh, just like the uh, equations and universe polymorphism, this is one of my choice pro uh, uh, projects. Um, so the type classes, they're familiar for, uh, from, for example, Haskell, and we can group a number of uh, types together. That's why it's called type class. Um, for instance, we have a class where all the types come together with a monoid structure. And then we can have uh, instances of that monoid structure. For example, the natural numbers with the plus operation or the natural numbers with the multiplication operation. Uh, in COC, the type classes, so in, in, in Haskell, the type classes really give uh, quite a big addition to the type system. In COC, it's really uh, very implemented very cleanly. Um, it's uh, just dependent records, which are already a part of the type theory. And then the eAuto, eAuto is, uh, it's a search database, uh, sorry, it's, it's a search mechanism. Um, so this is a, a standard tactic that was already there in COC. And this is reused in the type class mechanism. And then uh, because we can control this e auto quite well, we can also control type class search quite well. Um, so usually uh, we can prove that something, we, we can automatically find the proof that something has a certain age level just by finding an instance of the type class. Let's see. So here's an example. Uh, so if we know that uh, type A uh, has truncation level, has H level N plus one, then the path type of that, uh, that type has type level N. So if we want to prove that a path type has type level N, we just look at the type itself and want to prove that uh, this is bounded by N plus one. Uh, so this is something where type class search can really help us. And we say global instance here because it's preserved when we say close a section. Um, now to prove that something is, for example, a set, it would surface to prove that it's a proposition. So that's uh, what we do here. So we can always uh, prove that it's, it has a lower level. 
Well, obviously, we don't want to have, we, we want to give this a low priority. A high number means low priority. Um, because otherwise, we would always, first thing we would do is if we want to say that something has H level five, then the first thing that type class instance search would do was to prove that it has the level minus two, which of course is not what we want. So we want to be very careful with um, going down a level. Um, here we actually see that uh, we can, uh, if we already know that it, something is contractible or a proposition or an H set, uh, then we can directly lift them to anything that's higher than that level. Um, but we're only, so these are not type class instances, uh, and we only use them here uh, if we can immediately close, uh, close the proof with this. So if you want to prove that something has H level seven, and we happen to know that it's contractible, then we immediately solve it in this way. Now, we also have a, uh, um, we also know that uh, H levels are closed on their, um, on the equivalences, so that's proved in this lemma trunk equip. So now if you want to would make this into an instant search, into an instance, then what the type type class instant search would do, it would it wants to prove that um, B has H level N. So now it wants to apply this instance. So what it would do is it would find an A and F such that we have an equivalence here. But then this equivalence that would find is that it would take uh, A to be B and F to be the identity map. And then we're back where we were. So this would direct, if we add an instance here, this would direct a loop. So we need to be very careful how to steer that instance. Uh, we have a lot of experience with that from the uh, math classes library where um, we also talked. So this was developed when Mathieu was developing the uh, uh, the type class search, and we had uh, lots of fun debugging those things. Uh, so here, if you look at the truncations, well, uh, then we see that, so before, uh, what Andre showed you yesterday was the propositional truncation and the set truncation. Uh, he showed you this picture of uh, OK, where then first the O code failed and then the whole thing actually um, became contractible. Um, so that's this operation here. So this is the truncation, but we can do that for all, um, all H levels. So not just um, minus one and zero, but for each N. And uh, we would like to define this as a higher inductive type, but we don't have, uh, we haven't explained higher inductive type yet. So I will, uh, I will only go into this later on. And I think it will be mostly experts that will, uh, will be doing this. Uh, do I have it still have it open? No, this is the... I want to show off. I just want to find Andre's introduction. because somewhere here we had the logic. Just want to give you the picture so that uh, it's easier to remember. So here's the truncation that we saw before and that we discussed. And here are the logical operations, and then 
uh, as we saw. Um, so most of these operations, they preserve the, uh, the age levels, but this one doesn't. So this one needs to be truncated again. And that's precisely what we're doing here. So we take, oh. So we take the sum of P and Q and we add merely the truncation for it. Same thing for exists. Uh, that's the one you see here. And that's what we have here. There we go. And then I wanted to point you to the uh, function extensionality that uh, Andre showed you yesterday. Um, that's in this file. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of different formulation of function extensionality. Um, but this is the one that was discussed yesterday. I see there's a, um, there are tactics to work with for, but they're not left and right. Left and right are for products. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, thanks, Ali. And so this is, this is just a pointer that um, univalence actually implies functional exchangeality. Um, but the proof is, uh, the, the proofs in this meta theory directory, they're actually quite, uh, quite optimized. So it's nice to replay them, but they're not very instructive. And then in this file there, uh, lots of variations of univalence uh, and they're proved to be equivalent or some of them are proved to be equivalent. And again, this is, uh, uh, the, the proofs go quite, smooth, quite smoothly, but they're, uh, they're, they're optimized. So they're not the most instructive. So I won't show them in detail. Um, so at this point we've actually located um, most of the material you've seen in, in day one. So we've seen here. So at this point, we get to the action of univalence. So here are all the pointers uh, that should allow you to do all the uh, all the exercises. Uh, just have a look at them uh, when you get to them. So now I want to. Uh, are there any questions about it? I'm looking at the chat. I don't think there's anything urgent. Um, so I'd like to tell you a bit about the uh, the higher inductive types in uh, in COP. Uh, so what we saw before was the uh, the inductive types. The um, uh, so recall that all the um, uh, all the the operations on types uh, apart from the for all um, they were all defined as inductive types. So the products, uh, the uh, uh, sigma types. Uh, record types also inductive types. Um, also the the um, the empty the unit type, the natural numbers they're all inductive types. Um, so the inductive types tell you what happens on the constructor. They are given by the constructors. Um, but now we would also like to add constructors for uh, paths. So consider in in. So as uh, as we heard yesterday was. Um, a type uh, is actually a space. And now we, uh, so what we do when we do inductive types, we do free constructions. So now we want to freely construct points, but we also want to freely add a path between them. So here's one of the simplest examples we can make. Um, so the interval type, so it has two endpoints, which we call zero and one, and then we have a path between them. So we would like to say higher in the, higher inductive interval, and then it's at the lowest level. Uh, we have a constructor for zero, constructor for one, both in the interval. And we have a constructor for a path from zero to one. 
but Koch doesn't support this. And this is not a surprise because um, the high energy types that were invented after uh, long after Koch was uh, designed. Now there's a very nice trick by Dan Licata um, that works in, uh, in, in Acta and then later the private inductor types were added to Koch to be able to, uh, to, embed, to also allow this trick. Um, what I should say is that Cubico now actually does allow you to do to write syntax like this. So we can actually write uh, the interval in such a way uh, natively. So that's very nice. But we'll hear more about this later in the week. Um, so what these private inductive types do, and those were already available in Agda, um, was they disable pattern matching on these inductive types. So if you have a private inductive type with two constructors, zero and one, you won't be able to uh, pattern match them and you won't be able to use the discriminate tactic and a few other uh, tactics. Um, because if we could, we could actually say discriminate on those and we could prove that the, uh, um, the interval would actually coincide with the booleans, which of course is not good. Um, what we could do before uh, then the catastrophe trick was to um, you make this inductive type. So we just do the, uh, the booleans and then we add an inconsistent action saying that those two, uh, that the zero and one or true and false are actually equal. Of course, that's inconsistent, but as long as you don't use this inconsistency, it's probably okay. So it's okay to play with. The thing is that in that case, um, this won't compute. So what we want from, uh, uh, from, these, higher inductive, uh, from these higher inductive types that they actually compute well on the, uh, the zero cells, on the constructors. Um, we cannot hope to, uh, so, so there are models where it won't compute on the paths, but it actually computes well on the, uh, on the constructors. So in this case, if we apply the interval rec, the uh, recursion principle for the interval to uh, with a and b and apply it to zero, then we actually get a. And uh, this actually holds suspensely. Let's go to that file until. So here you can see how it actually uh, actually looks in, in Cox. So now we say, um, we make a private inductive type with zero and one, but we put this private inductive type in a module. Now we add an axiom saying that zero is equal to one. This one is inconsistent because um, they're actually different. So here we could, uh, could use this inconsistency um, and prove things that we should, were, were not allowed to prove. Uh, so, so in this place, we're not using the action, uh, but only to derive these, um, uh, sorry, to only to derive these, these principles. So we state from this inductive type, we derive the induction principle, we derive the, uh, we state as an axiom, the uh, beta reduction, the beta reduction for paths here. Um, but we don't need to state any beta reduction for point constructors. So and then here we see that uh, now when we close the module here, we no longer can do discriminate on these points here. So this should be, uh, we've actually hidden the, uh, the inconsistency away because to derive an inconsistency, we would need to, uh, uh, so, so we could derive an inconsistency by saying, well, we do uh, apply the discriminate tactic here and that will show that they are actually different, but we know that they're equal, so we, 
supply this actually. But now we can no longer do this outside this module. Can so I uh, make a quick comment about this? Uh, yeah, please. The inductive type stuff. So, higher inductive types aren't part of uh, you know Martin Locke type theory. So we have to add them in ourselves. One way we could do this is by axiomatizing that the constructors are part of this type that we've axiomatized to exist. But if we do this, then any induction principle we also postulate won't compute on the constructors. So the whole business with this private inductive type stuff, it's we're tricking Koch into computing on the point constructors. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, it looks a bit complicated, but all we're doing is postulating that such a higher inductive type exists and it computes the way you expect. Yes, so we, we could do something similar um, using the, um, just, just adding axioms uh, like what we would do here. Um, but so that's precisely what, uh, what Dan's observation is. If we have the Agda uh, private inductive types that we you know also have in Koch, uh, we can actually make sure that it computes on point constructors. So we have this equality here, uh, not only uh, propositionally, but actually judgmentally. So that, that's the big difference. And then, uh, yeah, to, because we have that judgmentally, uh, a lot of things actually become, uh, become easier. Um, yes, I'll, I'll get to the uh, co-equalizer construction in a minute. Is there a um, automation to uh, simulate beta, beta reduction? Um, for paths, so you would just rewrite with, uh, with this one. Uh, I don't think, uh, yeah. So, so that's actually a very good question from uh, Anton. So what you could do, um, you, you have these equalities and you could try to um, build a, a rewrite uh, database out of these beta reductions, uh, but uh, that's, that's not what's done uh, because you, you actually don't need them too often and then you just apply them by hand. So outside this um, module where we've hidden uh, this inconsistency, we then derive uh, the recursion principle from the induction principle. I mean, that's, that's straightforward. Um, and we apply, we get uh, the computation, the beta reduction for the recursor here for any path. And this is again, this is uh, propositional. It's not uh, uh, just mental. And then one of the things we want to prove about the uh, the interval, of course, is that it's contractible. And that's not too hard to prove. Now, uh, this is a familiar construction. This may not be uh, familiar to everyone, but this is familiar construction from category theory. So if you have two maps, uh, you can define the co-equalizer. Uh, so you just identify all the points in the, uh, uh, what is it? You identify all the points as is stated here. So it's the, uh, the codomain, but with this modulo this equality. So you say that two points are equal if they, uh, if you have this equality here. So you, again, you define the private inductive type. So it's precisely the same thing as before, uh, but now we need to uh, make sure that these functions actually uh, are also limited. So we actually annotate the, uh, the universe universe levels here explicitly. Then, so it's the same structure. So we have the inductive type. We add the equality here. We define the induction principle. We axiomatize uh, the, uh, the 
the one for the, the beta rule, because again, this is on uh, this is on path. So this is something we um, we cannot expect to to derive automatically. And then the structure is the same. So we derive the recursion principle from the induction principle. We derive this uh, beta reduction on the glue on the path that we actually defined here. So the structure is precisely the same. And then we prove the universal property from the uh, of the co-equalizer, like so. So this is a bit of a bit of category theory. And then some more basic properties about the uh, co-equalizer. So this is a standard example of the. Uh, uh, this is a standard example of a higher inductor type. And so, uh, Kelvin is asking us: if, Do we have the same issues? And that's precisely the same here. So, this would be inconsistent, but we don't expose that inconsistency. Now, finally, let's go to the circle. So that's a famous inductive type. So a direct way of defining it would be a circle has a base point and we just have a loop that goes from the base point to the base point. But because we've already defined, uh, already developed all this theory about the, uh, the co-equalizer, we can now, now just define the circle as the co-equalizer from the uh, um, the the uh, was co-equalizer of two uh, uh, two times the identity map from the unit to itself, and then we can derive the standard things, the uh, standard presentation of the circle from this presentation. And then we derive the induction principle and the uh, beta rule here. For the uh, for the loop, and again on the uh, base uh, on the base point, this computation actually works. Then we derive the recursion principle, and this is the same scheme as we've seen a number of times before. Uh, and I, the encode decode method, I think that's something that Eckbert will actually talk about. Uh, this went a bit faster than I uh, uh, than I thought, but that's actually good because then we have a bit more time for the uh, for the exercises. Are there any um, any questions about this part? No. Then. Uh, mature, I think we can go back to uh, to Discord now. Okay.